I was a young child living at home with my parents in Cleveland, Ohio, in the USA. Sometimes I would think, oh, my parents and all their adult friends, they must all be enlightened. Or maybe there's some other species. They seem so different, they seem so special, like they seem to know everything. So it was like there were two different worlds. One was my world of kind of being a child and playing with my brothers. I was the oldest, so sometimes I wasn't so kind to my brothers. But playing with my friends and I kind of understood that, but I always looked up to my parents as a kind of a guiding light in my life. I thought, oh, they must have some special kind of knowledge, and someday maybe I can be like them. I can have that special knowledge that they have, get that special kind of benefit that adults have. Whatever it was, I didn't know what it was, but I felt it was something special and mysterious. Kind of like almost, they were like deities of some kind, or gods. They would stay up late, which I wasn't supposed to do. And I think, oh wow, they must be talking about special things, you know, up late at night. So, I don't know if this is similar to the way other children feel about their parents. But if they feel that way, then we can really see what a tremendous influence our parents can have on us when we're young. Before we realize that they're only human beings and that they can make just as many mistakes as young children do, sometimes more. So children are always, you know, so young children are always so impressionable. And of course, their parents are the beginning of society. In the beginning, they know their mother and their father. And that's it. That's the whole world to them. Of course, in some hospitals, it's not quite that way anymore, but maybe that's kind of a shame. I, uh, now, some doctors are saying it's good that the child come back and be with the mother as soon as possible. You know, to feel the warmth of the mother, to get nursed by the mother, to feel her, to hear her voice, and just to feel that sense of security of being with someone that loves you. So this is really a wonderful thing. And I was watching a video this evening uh, with Monday here, and we saw how even animals really have this exceptional quality of caring for their young nursing them, licking them when they're, when they're dirty, getting food for them. We even saw a leopard that was caring for a young uh, baboon. It was pre pretty amazing that that leopard had actually adopted that baboon as her little child because they're natural enemies. So this kind of mothering quality and kindness that is we think is innate to women, but also men also possess this quality, is even intrinsic to many, many animals. And it's amazing how, although I talked about karma last week, how nobody can change our karma, yet the influence that our parents can have us on us is nothing short of amazing and incredible because they're our first impression of the world and of society. It's the beginning of society to have parents. So I'm going to put my glasses on now so I can see what I've written. I just made a brief outline. This is actually kind of an impromptu talk. I didn't really know I was going to talk about this until one of the people here was telling me about his kids, one of the students here, and we started talking. And I thought, oh, wow, this is
this is really a relevant issue because maybe it's something that not a lot of well, it's not something that monks talk about a lot, it would seem to me, but something that is certainly relevant, and so it's deserving of our attention. And what is it, from my point of view as a bhikkhu, that is so important about parenting and how we can be good parents? So, what I saw in my own parents really influenced me. So from the point of view of karma, of course I was born with my own karma. Uh, but I came to my mother's womb and I chose my parents because of that karma. Because I had that karma, I had a karmic affinity with my parents, that is. I chose to be born to them. And so, the way I look at it is I must have had some good karma in the past because I chose some good parents. So, the fact that all you people are here means that you're concerned. You're concerned about yourselves, and you're concerned about the world. You want to make yourselves better, and of course you would like to see the world better. And the way we can start doing this is through our children. My mother was always a very... Uh, when I was young, she used to come in and see me every night. She would come in sometimes, she would scratch my back, and bring me some food, something, some cereal, to eat in the evening, and then we would talk. We would have these kind of intimate talks. And she'd tell me all about her feelings, about her hopes and her dreams. And I really absorbed a lot of this. My mother was a real kind of a searcher. Actually, eventually she became a Buddhist. She's a Buddhist now, living in Australia. She became a Tibetan Buddhist. But she was always searching for something. So she really instilled that desire in me to seek out the truth. My father, on the other hand, was a, a medical doctor, very kind person very generous person, a very noble-hearted person. If people didn't have money, he wouldn't charge them. He would give, provide optical services, uh, an, uh, an ophthalmology, ophthalmology, that's the correct word, services for free. And also I remember when I was young, uh, in later years, my father came from a poor neighborhood, he came from a poor family and kind of worked his way up and became a doctor. But he had friends who were uh, from, uh, he lived in a poor area and there were a lot of black people there, Negroes. And my father was very friendly with them. And even later, in later years, he, he loaned uh, a fellow who had a garage, he loaned him some money. And those people were always so grateful. So when my father died, he came to the funeral. I was amazed at how many people came to the funeral. But anyways, I learned not to be prejudiced towards other people because of the color of her skin. And this was due to my father's example. He had a tremendous example. He was a very kind-hearted person. And so I saw, oh, this must be good, so maybe I should help other people. So, even though they didn't have to tell me, oh, my name was Jeff back then, oh, you have to be generous, you have to do this, you have to do that. But because they set that kind of example for me, I saw, oh, this is really good. Oh, he has so many friends, I never knew. He's so kind. And even in my young mind, I, I saw, there's something wonderful about this. So I wanted to emulate him. And I also, uh, my mother's desire to find the truth was also instilled in me. So that, no doubt, eventually led me to the monkhood. And now I'm a big group. And I, and I feel a tremendous debt of gratitude to my parents for that. And so, this is the influence they had on me. Now, I, I was married in the past, but I never had a daughter, I never had a son, I had a stepdaughter, I'm still in touch with her. So, as a result of that, you know, I also wanted to be a good parent to my stepdaughter. And then, maybe she, through my influence, now she has a couple of children, she's married, also wants to be a good parent. And who knows, the cycle goes on and on. And if we respect our parents, and we remember them, then maybe our children also will. And, when, and, and whatever realm they're in, if they can see this, if they can recall this, and, and, and understand that not only do their children uh, respect and love them, and, and, and feel gratitude to them, but their children's children, and their children's children's children, 
then that, certainly, if they can receive that merit, they will be very happy to know this, that uh, we are grateful to our parents. And on another level, if we teach our children, and our children teach their children, good and virtuous ways, teach them to have a purified mind, to be compassionate and helpful to other people, who knows, our parents will someday have to be reborn to them. So it's like we're spreading our merit indirectly to our parents. Um, as far as how we can do this, as I said, my parents never really, of course they taught me, my father was a very moral person, but he never really directly told me, you know, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. Of course they did to some degree, but I would say the greater influence was through their example. And so, I want to say something else about karma. Of course, I had my own karma, but the way my parents were, they were actually supporting factors for the ripening of my wholesome karma. So that's the way people can influence each other. They can't necessarily change our karma, but what they can do is provide us an opportunity and an encouragement, an incentive for us to change our own karma, either, either for the, the better or for the worse. Now, one thing about kama is that, I don't know if I clarified it in the, in the speech the other night, is that kama, kama has various different ways. There's, there's kama uh, that we perform through our thoughts, our speech, and our actions. But really, the, the thoughts are really the beginning. They're the, they're the source of our speech and our actions. So our thoughts really have a powerful influence on the way we act. And you know, it's interesting because parents can try to, you know, superficially set an example for their kids. The kids are very sensitive. They pick up, they can really pick up the thoughts and the feelings of their parents. For example, if their parents don't love each other, even though they put on a good front, the kids can really pick that up. And they can pick up when, when a mother or a father is not feeling loving towards them either. They can really pick that up. And then, and then these children can grow up with some kind of psychological problems that they can't overcome, you know, that obstructing karma that's been created by their parents. So, really, the way I see it, and which is in agreement with the, the first uh, verse in the Dhammapada that I recited the other day, is that Mind is the forerunner. You know, when we when we think or act with an unwholesome mind, you know, suffering follows us like the wheel of a cart. So, uh, like like excuse me, like like the like the wheel of a cart follows the hoof of the oxen that's drawing it. So, the reason I bring this analogy out is because so often people put the cart before the horse, as they say. The cart, the horse is drawing the cart, but yet they put the cart before the horse. Now what do I mean by that? And what I mean is that people are looking for results, but they don't understand that in order to achieve those results, you require to first create that mental quality of your mind, in your mind, that will make it possible for you to achieve that result. And oftentimes, especially in terms of karma, if we want to, for example, receive certain kinds of benefits, for example, uh, clothing, wealth, food, we don't really have to go out and take that from anybody else. If we create the qualities in our mind of generosity, kindness, providing food for others, then, in a sense, we're setting up so that those good thoughts and actions will come back to us. So, the point I'm making about not putting the cart before the horse, if we want our children to be noble people, kind-hearted, loving, compassionate, honest, uh, have all sorts of good qualities, have inquisitive minds, have an interest in the Dhamma, we don't need to force that on them. We need to change our own minds first. We need to develop those very qualities within ourselves. And that, those thoughts, those, that attitude within our own mind 
will have a profound influence on our children. And of course, it will also cause us to act in such a way that we set a noble example for our children. And then, of course, children mimic adults. So they will see that as an example in their own lives. My father was a swimmer. He used to take us swimming. When I was about six months old, he threw me in the water. And I was swimming around, you know, like a fish. And everybody in our family loved to swim. It was like a pastime. We used to go out, we used to go swimming together. And it was really fun. And as a result of that, because my father was a swimmer, and he took us swimming, we'd all, always go down to the YMCA or another swimming pool. You know, now I'm still swimming, actually. I'm a swimming people. <laughs> I'm not supposed to actually... Swimming is allowed for a big group if it's not just playing in the water, but it's therapy for me. I, the doc, actually, I have, I have an excuse. The doctor told me I need to exercise, and he told me swimming is a good exercise. So that's all the excuse I needed to start swimming again. Uh, anyways, let me see what, what else I have. I've got a lot more just kind of written down, sketched, that I thought of after talking to this other person today. Um, as I said, parents must really change themselves and set the example. They don't have to, you know, set a mandate, create a mandate or command their children to be in a certain way. Because uh, an example is a much more powerful way of getting your children to change and, and having them instill positive qualities in them. Of course, we need to understand every child has its own individual mind. So one child may respond very positively to our example, while another child may not. You can't, you can't always, you know, have everything the way you would like. And so that's a very important thing because one of the talks, a talk I was thinking of giving about counting, is a very important quality developed with our with our children: patient forbearance. So, and that means if we have too many expectations about our children, we're not going to be patient with them. Oh, why don't you learn your studies better? You only got a such and such. You only got a C on your last semester. You need to get a B. You need to get an A. Well, if we don't have patience, you know, the child will get, may begin to get self-conscious. And there's already enough competition going on in society, in the school systems nowadays. So the parents don't need to really put their, their kids under that kind of pressure. Actually, if the parents are both studious, if they don't spend all the time watching television, which is a topic I'm going to get into later, it's one of my favorite, um, what would you call it, bugger books. I don't even know if you know what that word means. But it's, uh, I have a thing about TV because uh, um, I spent so much time in front of the TV as a young child. It was just coming into prominence in the U.S. back then. And I understand how, how it can be a, a very destructive and dangerous type of thing. Especially if the parents set the example, then it's a way to lose the opportunity to have that kind of interrelationship with your children. But I'll say more about that later. So, how can the parents set a good example? And uh, there's a lot of things they can do, but uh, I just wrote down a few of them, and some of them might even surprise you. The first thing is, if you don't want your kids to smoke or drink alcohol, well, then you might want to think about not doing that yourself, because if the kids see you, if your children see you smoking and drinking, then they may think, oh, my parents can smoke and drink, why can't I? So, this is the kind of thing that's not going to really help your kids. And actually, it's against the precepts anyways. Taking alcohol is against the precepts. Now, smoking isn't, but the thing about smoking is, if you live with somebody who smokes, you know that after a while the clothes begin to smell, the house begins to smell, the curtains begin to smell, everything begins to smell. And the kids will begin to smell too, cigarette smoke. 
So, and also, in a certain sense, if you're smoking, they're also secondary smokers. They're inhaling, you know, they're getting some of that smoke in their system. So I, of course, my parents neither smoked nor drank, so they set a good example. But another thing that parents can do, and most of them don't realize this, is if they eat it, try to eat a healthy diet, and uh, are aware of what they're eating, and even explain to their kids if they're curious, well, you know, I'm eating this because it makes me feel good. I feel strong, I feel healthy, I can be active during the day, I don't get too fat, uh, and, and, I, and it gives me a long life. And I'm happy. I'm happy when I eat good food. And uh, uh, because I can, I can be active and be with you and be with my wife and we can have a really good time together. If I'm sick, I'm just going to be a burden. So then you can educate them. And especially nowadays with all the junk food on the market and McDonald's, you know, uh, which is very popular amongst a lot of young kids. And uh, uh, because they really have their advertising system, they, they've really got to figure it out, you know, what attracts the kids, you know, Ronald McDonald and all sorts of colors and stuff. So you've got some competition there. But we know, I know from living in the U.S., if you hang around Ronald, like Ronald McDonald too much and you eat too many, you know, too many French fries and too much you know, McDonald's burgers and, and all their artificial shakes and artificial this and artificial that. There are people in the United States, I don't know if you believe this, but I could probably fit about three or four of me into one of their pants. I mean, they're huge. They're like, they're like cows. They eat cows and they actually look like cows. It's incredible. You, you can't believe it. Some of them can't even get out of bed. They can't even sit up. They need a crane to get out of bed. So, that's something we want to be aware of, that if you, if you eat denatured food, it's going to denature your body. It messes up your whole metabolism, your endocrine system. Your body just gets completely out of whack when you're eating this garbage. So, the first thing to do is you want to be aware of health foods. I know health foods are expensive and organic food is expensive, but it's not as expensive as chemotherapy. It's not as expensive as having open heart surgery. It's not as expensive as having a hip replacement or a stroke. You know, because not only, that not only costs you money, but it costs your life sometimes. And if it doesn't take your life completely, it'll compromise your health. So you won't be able to work and you become a burden to society. And then if you live in the U.S., you might not even be able to pay your insurance bills. I know, I know the president administration is trying to do something about that, and Hillary Clinton also did, but they're going to get a lot of competition there. So, uh, a lot of resistance. So hopefully they can do something, you know, because it seems that President Obama has some real concern for the people and wants to help them out there. When I broke my hip, uh, back about 13 years ago, it cost me $30,000 because I didn't have insurance. So, uh, and that wasn't even a hip replacement. And I don't want a hip replacement. But that's just to give you an idea. And, uh, and you're talking open heart surgery, forget it. You'll be in debt for the rest of your life. So, it's really important to be aware of how if you know the example, and actually for your own benefit too, you should try to be, educate yourself about the benefits of eating food without sugar, without MSG, without uh, artificial coloring, artificial flavoring, preservatives like potassium sorbate, and uh, maybe try to drink pure water like this, and uh, uh, generally eat a healthy diet. And I'm not trying to push vegetarianism, even though you've got two vegetarian vehicles here. But uh, <laughs> if, you, if you don't eat too much meat, it's probably better. I mean, you know, I'm not telling you to be vegetarian, but just be aware that too much meat had, can create a lot of problems in terms of its fat content, in terms of, of uh, 
creating too much of an acidic condition in your body. So the body needs to find an acid-alkaline balance. And generally speaking, fruits and raw vegetables help to create an alkaline condition in the body. And cooked food, and especially meat and, and high-protein foods will create more of an acidic condition. So we need to get that balance. And also fluorinated water is not so healthy. And if you can get a good spring water with a pH of about 7.3 to 7.5, slightly alkaline, that's also uh, a really good type of water to drink. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that I don't really know about uh, fluoridation and so many other things. Uh, electromagnetic radiation, getting kids being not too close to a television set, especially color TV, but now with the new type of screens, it's not so dangerous. But there's all kinds of problems in the pollution, of course, and sound pollution. And of course, I'm going to get into the next subject, which is uh, overstimulation of the senses for, one, for young children, because they've got computers now, they've got TV, They've got Walkmans, they've got videos. Uh, you know, three years old and a lot of kids in the U.S. now are playing video games. So, just on a physical level, that's not too healthy. They're just sitting around instead of getting out like I was when I was a young kid. We'd get out and run around and kick the ball around and play sports. But now they're just playing video games. And you can do it in, in virtual reality, of course, you can do anything you want. If you want to kill 20, 30 people, you can do it, no problem, no sweat. So, it's not a very good way of, of learning how to socialize with other kids, and it's uh, also unhealthy. So, okay, so we talked about healthy diet and, and a little bit about healthy lifestyle. Now, I was an athlete when I was younger, and my father was a swimmer, I learned to swim, and I think it's nice to have some kind of physical activity because people, modern day people, have become more and more sedentary. We just sit around, either working on the computer or we go to our job and we sit and sit and sit. And so we're not getting enough exercise. We're not circulating, our blood is not circulating. We're not, uh, sometimes of course, we're, we're living in, in polluted places. But usually we don't exercise enough to really breathe deeply. And so I think sports are a pretty good way for kids in the beginning, young children, not too young of course, to get out there and keep the body healthy. And uh, also it helps to uh, keep the mind healthy too, to have some kind of physical activity. Now other possibilities which are not competitive are like yoga, uh, tai chi, and other things. Of course, if they see that you're interested, like my father was a swimmer, then your kids are going to be interested too. They're going to think, oh, it must be fun. My parents are doing it. Why don't we do it? Of course, both of my parents would go swimming. So it was like a family affair. Sometimes we'd go to the beach. We used to go to the lake, Lake Erie, until it got too polluted. Uh, and uh, of course, they're cleaning it up a little bit now. I don't, some areas you can swim again in Lake Erie. But at one time, it was extremely polluted. So the, the next thing is uh, about setting an example is, maybe this is the most important one of all, is the husband and wife really need, the mother and father really need to love each other. If they don't love each other, it ain't going to work. I mean, you're going to have kids who can sense that. And then especially if they see mother and father arguing with each other in front of them, it's setting a really bad example for them. They might actually not, not want to get married, or they may become antisocial, or develop other kind of, of uh, symptoms from seeing that kind of thing happen. So I know, and the problem is you can't fake it. You can try, and of course it's better if you're going to have an argument, if a husband and wife are going to have an argument, it's better they not do it in front of their kids. But better than that is to if you're practicing as a Buddhist, is to understand, well, let's try to overcome anger. Let's try to develop loving kindness for one another and understand how this is benefiting not only ourselves, but our children as well. So, 
parents really, really need to practice loving kindness. And that may not be an easy thing, because you've got two people living together, and, you know, there may be, there may be differences of opinion, as there always are. But if they make the effort, it's better than if they make no effort. That's right effort. One of the factors of the Eightfold Noble Path. We have to know what kind of effort we need to make. You don't want to make the wrong effort, because that's not going to help. But the right effort would be, well, let's practice sila, let's practice mental with one another. Then, that's right effort. Right effort means you have to have an intention, and you have to put energy into it. So parents really need to put energy into that aspect of their relationship. Very important. Another way that uh, they can set an example for their kids, and I, I mentioned this, is if they practice sila. If they know, for example, my father was a very generous person. I saw that, and I've always been influenced by that. Uh, I always wanted to be generous. I remember one time I was in the U.S., and I, I really never had the chance to intellectually understand it, but I had, I had that example for me. So I was never too stingy about, my, about money. It didn't seem maybe they, that, I mean, you, you can't be stingy about money if you're a big group. Well, you can be, but you're not supposed to be. Anyways, I remember one time I was in a train station. I was going to a meditation retreat. It was Christmas Day, and I saw a young woman uh, with her young, newborn baby. And she looked a little bit like a gypsy, you know, kind of walking in the train station. And it was Christmas Day, and even though both my parents were Jewish, uh, I had the Christmas spirit. So, uh, and actually, you know, Jesus talked about being good Samaritans. So, and the Buddha also encourages Donna, helping others. So I took out $50 and I gave it to her and I said, Merry Christmas. I mean, maybe that was not the greatest thing to do, but I can tell you this much. After I did that, I was, ex I was in like an altered state for about two days afterwards. I was feeling so much pity. It really, and I always remember that. I mean, because I didn't, it was a kind of a, a, an un, a spontaneous thing. I didn't think about it beforehand, but yet that act of kind of dana and, and karuna on my part changed my whole, for two days, I was, I was as I said, it just changed my whole attitude towards life. In a way. So, of course, if we can do that with our children and with our husbands and wives, oh, what a wonderful world it would be. We'd all be in pity. We'd have, not pity, not P-I-T-Y, but P-I-T-I. Pity means feeling joy or a kind of happiness. Well, more joy, I guess, uh, or like an ecstasy almost. So, uh, it not only is good for the kids, but it will be wonderful for the relationship. And good for ourselves, most of all. As far as the precepts go, you know, my father was an honest person, so I always thought, oh, honesty is the best policy. And uh, my mother was always an inquisitive person, a very honest woman. So I always, I actually, those qualities were also instilled in me. Now, as far as the five, five precepts go, okay, not to kill. Well, my parents, of course, they didn't kill other living beings, but not being Buddhist, they, uh, they didn't have the, the understanding that a Buddhist has about killing insects, and they were not vegetarian. Even though my father later got interested in vegetarianism. Uh, but as Buddhists, if we really want to set an example for our kids, we can do that. If a cockroach comes into the house, instead of getting out your spray, I don't know what they call it here, it's called raid in the U.S. And, you know, spray an out damn co cockroach, out, out, and you kill it, then your kids are going to pick that up. They think, oh, it's okay, it's okay to kill. You know, it's okay to kill other living beings. Now that's not always easy. 
when I was, uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, I was at, uh, at Bodhihar in Penang, and I was walking out and I met a Hindu couple, and they were, uh, the husband and wife were sitting there, kind of on the porch, and we just got to talking, and she says, well, I just, I, I talked about not killing other living beings, and she said, well, I just killed about five mosquitoes in the house. And I said, well, from a Buddhist point of view, uh, we, we try to abstain from killing. And she said to me, well, you know, you can get malaria. And uh, they can cause all sorts of problems, dengue and malaria, she said. And besides, they're a nuisance. So I said, where are you going to draw the line? You know, if you can kill one insect, maybe you can kill another insect. Maybe you can kill an animal. And then, you know, what about what people do to each other? And maybe you'll end up killing people. So, the fact that we don't kill insects shows that we have compassion for all living beings. And because some people can be very irritating to us, much more irritating than a mosquito, and they can be much worse than malaria. Some people, in fact, are worse than animals. I mean, they treat each other worse than animals. And, I mean, I've seen that to some degree in my life which I'm not going to go to any details, but all you have to do is read the history books and you can see how people have treated each other in the past. And you can look at all the wars and how different tribes, you know, will slaughter each other and kill their, the women and children too, everybody. So, if, if, you find, if you find justification in killing other animals, you can easily find justification in killing human beings, since as I said, some of them are worse than animals. And of course, that's why wars continually go on. But if we don't want wars to continue, then one thing we can do is we can teach our kids. And the way to teach them, as I said, is through example. So if we have really compassion for other living beings, then they're going to see this. And they're going to think twice, even before they step on an ant. I didn't understand that when I was young. I just used to sit around with a fly swatter, killing flies. And I used to think that, well, that was kind of like, you know, a game for me. I didn't understand. But, and of course, because my parents did not teach me that, that's something I didn't learn as, as a young child. But had I seen their example, maybe I wouldn't even have done that. So, we can really have that influence on our kids. And I know there's somebody I talked to here who told me about his father who was a farmer. And when all the other people would go out shooting animals, he wouldn't do that. And I think his father has had a great influence on his life because of that. Because he saw in that example of his father that he didn't want to kill other animals. So then there's mm, not, not stealing. Of course, if we see our parents don't steal, that means they're also honest. And of course, parents you know, don't want to steal from others. And, they, and if we see that in our own life, we won't think that it's okay to steal. Because a lot of kids think it's okay to steal. You know, if they're in a store and nobody can see them, they take something, put it in their pocket, and they think, well, if nobody catches me, it's okay. But it's not. From the point of view of comma, as soon as you do it, you're caught. Because that comma is going to produce a result. Not necessarily, but the chances are. And you're adding to your stock of bad comma. So one way or the other, it produces a result. So as far as telling the truth, this is really important. Maybe this is one of the most important things for your kids, is don't lie to your kids. Really, don't ever lie to them. I mean, you can tell them a story as long as they know it's only a story. But don't pretend that that story is true. And if somebody's sick, maybe it's better to say, well, you know, Mom, uh, you know, uh, yes, well, Aunt such and such, she's not feeling well now. They should know the truth about things. It's better to tell them the truth. Unless, of course, that truth is going to be so painful that, they, that they're too young to understand it. But then, don't lie to them, at least. Better, maybe better not to say anything. Uh, of course, they don't need to know about all the terrible things that are happening in the world. And maybe when, in, at home, it's better not to discuss all these things anyways. You know? Otherwise, if, you, if, you, if you, you're always watching the news, and you're always reading the, the newspapers about all the terrible things that are going to happen in the world. I mean, 
That's enough to make anybody sad and depressed or angry. So it's probably better not to bring those kind of things into the house. And uh, one way you can do that is to kill your television, as I said before. But we'll get into that later. Um, oh, okay. So then, of course, uh, parents need to be uh, loyal to one another. Now, I can speak from personal experience because my parents were truly devoted to one another for about a long time. But then something happened. And as a result of that, the marriage fell apart. And as a result of that, I was in pretty bad shape after that. As a matter of fact, I mean, I don't. I don't want to tell you all the personal details, but uh, it really influenced our family and it caused a tremendous amount of suffering to the point that I, I almost committed suicide. And it was that much of a shock because I always thought my parents were so devoted to one another. And also, one of my brothers has passed away. And I, I, there was no doubt in my mind that what happened between my parents was a contributing factor to his death. And it caused a lot of suffering in our family. A tremendous amount of suffering. So, maybe this is the most important rule of all. Don't cheat on your spouse. Especially if you've got kids. Don't even think of it, you know, because it's going to cause untoward suffering. Untoward, you can, unimaginable suffering for that child. And that child will become disillusioned in life and cynical. And then as a result, that child may pass on all its agony and misunderstanding and misery to another person if they get married, or they may not even want to get married because of what they've seen and experienced. So this is really an important one. It doesn't have anything to do with your kids, but indirectly it certainly does. So any time that thought even comes into your mind, think about it twice and say, well, what, is, what is that going to do to my kids? You know, of course, if two people can't live together and it's creating a lot of disharmony, then it's possible they need, may need to separate. I'm, I'm only a bhikkhu. I'm not the judge of that. But if you do it, do it right. Don't go out and cheat and cause... You know, like treason. Don't go out and betray the other person. Speak up and tell your feelings honestly and work it out if you can. If you can't work it out, then sometimes people actually need to separate. But don't do it that way that I just, just described because it's going to cause incredible pain, unbelievable pain. Do it in a way that's amicable with both. So that if two people need to part because their lives are really going in different directions, and this can actually happen sometimes, then they should do it and part like clouds drifting apart amicably, you know, without any kind of bad feelings, understanding, well, our lives are going in different directions and we don't want to hurt our kids. So let's do it without bad feelings. Let's still have be friends and have respect for one another, even as we go our own separate ways. And last, of course, I've already talked about not drinking and not uh, smoking. Smoking is not against the precepts unless it's smoking marijuana or hashish or, or taking some kind of narcotic drugs. That would certainly be a violation of the precepts. So, for the sake of your children, if not for your own sake, don't drink. Don't take drugs. And also, as I said, smoking is not quite so bad, but don't do that either. Think about, think about the future generations. Why pollute the atmosphere, pollute your children, pollute your body, and pollute your minds? You know, so this is, this is the benefits of practicing Sila. Because Sila has a way of wearing off on other people, especially your kids. They see you practicing Sila, they see you devoted to the Dhamma. They're going to naturally have that inclination to follow in your footsteps. Okay, so uh, 
I've already spoken about generosity, which would include, of course, Donna. Uh, and if your kids see you meditating, coming to the center here, you can even bring them. Then this is a great way to introduce them to the spiritual life, to the life of because uh, they, they can listen to Dhamma talks, they, they're with monks, they're with people who come together for the same reason, and, you know, at least you're not associating with fools, hopefully, and uh, you're, you have chosen wise friends, people who are really interested in your welfare, and uh, you're in an environment where at least you know bad things are not going on, and, of course, a lot of good things are happening if you go to the right place. So, uh, and sometimes even parents can meditate at home. If the children see that, you don't even have to tell them, oh, well, come and meditate with us. They might be very curious. Just like I was when I was a young child, my parents would stay up. Sometimes they'd have friends over and they'd be talking. I was like, Gosh, I wonder what they're talking about. There must be something very special because they're adults, you know, some kind of mysterious thing, you know. Maybe they're talking about some other world or something, you know. It's just, I'm so curious to know what they were doing. So, let's say you get together with friends, are, you, are the mother and father are meditating, the kids might get very curious. Wow, what are they doing? Oh, that's so mysterious. They're not talking. They're not even speaking, but they're sitting together. Oh, wow. I wonder what's happening. Maybe they're, maybe they're really enjoying it. Maybe I should try. Then you can really, really have an incredible influence just by doing that. You don't even have to say anything. They wonder, oh, this is a special time for my mom and dad. They don't talk. They don't watch TV. They're not on the computer. They're not drinking beer or, or going out to parties or leaving us in front of the TV. But they're, they're in their room meditating now. So that's power of example. You know, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words, but an action is worth a thousand pictures. So, if you can prove through your example, you know, that you're really, really into this, you really believe in the benefits of meditation, and then they see actually the benefits arising because you're more calm, because you're more loving with one another, because you're more clear-sighted. Oh, you say, oh, mommy and daddy are doing this. They're such wonderful people. Gosh, I'd like to grow up and be like them. So, a few other points that I've made, and that is, never yell at your child. And never hit your child if you're angry. Now, one question that came up earlier today when I was talking with this layperson was, well, what about hitting your child? And there may be some cases where discipline is necessary. Okay? If your child is always running out in the street and you know your child can get hit by a car, and you talk to your child, you say, look, this is very harmful, you might get hit by a car. If they still don't understand, well, you might have to spank them. Because sometimes, you know, by doing that, you can actually save their life. But don't do it angrily. Don't, and don't yell at them, especially if you're angry, you know. Let them know, okay, this is, this, you're doing something wrong. I've asked you not to do this. Give them a little whack. Not in the face. Don't ever hit your child in the face. You can give them a little whack on, on their fanny, on their, on their butt. Just to let them know, don't do that, you know. Come on. You want to get hit by a car? Don't do that. Then, just like I saw you letting your cat know earlier today. <laughs> so, I mean, some, then they understand that, oh, oh, mommy said not to do that. I better not do that. But, of course, I'm only talking about rare occasions. Because some parents, they get into abusing and hitting their kids. I've seen some, some situations. I saw... I can't remember where it was. Was it Burma or Sri Lanka? I don't think it was here. But the mother kept on hitting her child. The child was crying and crying. She said, shut up, shut up. And the more she hit the child, 
the more the child cried, and the angry, the more the child cried, the angrier she got, and she kept on hitting and hitting the child. And I thought, oh my gosh, how is that? Well, how is that child going to be when it grows up, when it has a mother like that? You can't do that to your child. I mean, you can, of course, but think about the consequences. So I would say to reserve that kind of discipline for very rare occasions when you think it's really necessary. Otherwise, better to sit down and have a talk with your child. I mean, you know, children are not stupid. They may be immature in some ways. They may not be, you know, have, they may not be ready to go to high school and learn how to read and write, but they have their, they, they have comma, and some, some children have very good comma. They can understand very, very quickly what you're trying to tell them if you explain it to them properly. So it's really nice to be able to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with your child. And you don't have to sit and you don't have to talk to them like you're someone inferior to you. You can speak to them on the same level and say, look, you know, I've told you to do this many times, and I want to explain why it's not going to be good. Because if, if you go out into the street, you know, there are some people who drive and they drive very fast. And they may not be able to see you. And then if they hit you with a car, remember the other day when we saw that animal on the road that had been hit by a car? You don't want to end up like that. But it could happen. If you get hit by a car, you might die. You don't want to die, do you? I don't want to see you die. So please, for my sake and for your sake, you know, please don't go out on the street. Don't run out on the street. You know, look both ways before you cross. And don't run out. Let's walk, we can, we can walk together across the street. For a young child, you might want to do that. Let's walk together across the street and hold that child's hand. So, that's just, uh, what I'm talking about is discipline. Uh, I have a few more things about discipline. Well, I, I think I said that. Always be honest, and never insult your child. So, actually, for big we shouldn't do that. Because they're not supposed to insult each other. So, like, bhikkhus can't say, oh, you're a donkey, you stupid such and such. That's considered to be an offense for bhikkhus. So, of course, parents don't need to do that, you dumb, you stupid, you know, ignoramus. You know, then the child begins to think, oh, maybe I'm dumb, maybe I'm stupid, maybe I'm an ignoramus. You don't need to do that. If you want to discipline your child, speak to your child in a gentle way, kind. Oh, Johnny, come here, you know, or Mary, come here, or whatever your child's name is, come here. You know, let's have, let's sit down and have a talk. You know what I said the other day about such and such about going out on the street, or about hanging out with such and such friends. You know, let me explain to you. I want you to understand. Can you? And then you explain it. Can you understand what I'm trying to tell you? And let them respond. If you get that kind of, you know, heart-to-heart -heart conversation with your kids. A lot of them would understand. Of course, as I mentioned before, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And the Buddha talked about four kinds of horses. There's one horse that runs at the shadow of the whip, and you don't even need to whip that horse. As long as it sees the shadow, you hold the whip in your hand, the horse is going to run. It's a very smart horse. It says, I don't, need, I don't want to get whipped, I'll run. Then there's another type of person, like a second kind of horse. And that is, if once it doesn't run in the shadow of the whip, but if it feels the sting of the whip, it runs. Then there's a third kind of person, uh, I think maybe I fit into this category, is you have to really hit that horse hard, and then we'll finally run. And then there's a fourth kind of person, which, like a horse, it just doesn't run. No matter how much you hit it with and whip it, it ain't gonna run. It just doesn't run. So, and that's that's a result of their comma, you know. So kids have different comma, but you should always give your child the benefit of the doubt. Eventually, you may know. Well, one child really needs to be whacked. Another child, you might never have to hit that child. You might just say, look, Johnny, don't go out in the street. You know, it's dangerous. Don't put your hand in the fire. It's going to burn your hand. 
Some kids, you say, don't put your hand in the fire. Immediately, they stick their hand in the fire. Oh, does it really burn? Let me find out. So, uh, that requires a certain amount of wisdom. Skillful means, you know, you know skillful means with high up. Be, be, parents need to have a little skill in terms of dealing with your kids. To know what works and what doesn't work. So, if something works, you don't need to use something something else more severe. If it doesn't work, you might need to go and use something else. But this requires, uh, you know, understanding on the parents' part. Maybe the parents, the mother and father, need to sit down and talk about it. Well, it seems, you know, Jimmy has a problem, you know. What should we do about it? You know, we tell him not to do this and he does it anyways. You know, we don't want to see him get hurt. But uh, then, of course, they have their options. They can try some discipline. Maybe they can go to see a counselor. Maybe they can try to bring the child to a place like this. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have the answer to, you know, all the problems in the world. But, uh, of course, to some degree, we can't, we can't really change the world completely. We can change our own lives, and in some cases, we can change the lives of our children. But it's limited. And so then it gets back to Kanti, patient tolerance. We do the best we can without any expectations, without attachment. And this has to do with another question that came up today about being attached to the children. Because you love them, so you feel attached to them. And then the child does something, leaves home, or does something you don't like, and you feel really bad because you have all this attachment. So it's really important to know the difference between love and attachment. Most people nowadays think love, attachment is part of love. Well, it's part of passion in that love. It's part of kamachanda, love with lust. But even then, it's an impure love. So if, when we talk about metta, metta is not something that we have where we have attachment. Metta is a quality of the heart where we are willing to allow that person to be as it is, as that person is, and we still send all these thoughts of well-being to them. We don't require them to follow in our footsteps, to be exactly like we are, to follow, let's say we're Buddhists, and your child doesn't want to be a Buddhist. Well, if you really love them, you're not going to say, well, if you don't want to be a Buddhist, I don't want you to be around here. You leave home then. Go off and do your own. No, that's not the way. That's not the practice of Buddhism. Kanti, basic tolerance. Even if your kids don't live up to your expectations, you still love them. And this can actually be like, of course, I don't know if the story is in, uh, it's a Mahayana Buddhist story about the, the, uh, the child that left home. And Eventually that child came back after many, many years to the father. And the father said, oh, I'm so happy to be my son again, to see my son again. But the son didn't recognize the father. So the father allowed that child to stay and stay and stay. And eventually that child proved himself to be a good person. And the father, you know, gave him all his wealth. That's the story of the... Yeah, it's in the Lotus Sutra. sutra. Uh, but anyways, so... If we're patient, you know, if we don't have that attachment, we'll be patient. We'll be loving regardless of what our children do. And then we can still have that influence on them. But if we reject them, they might also reject us. And then it creates that kind of separation, that kind of bad feeling that those children will carry around with them for the rest of their lives. My father, mommy, daddy, they, they rejected me just because I wanted to be, you know, I didn't want to practice Buddhism. So then they're going to think, oh, are Buddhists like this? Well, I don't want to be Buddhist. They don't even accept me as their son or my, our daughter. And, and yet they call themselves Buddhists? Oh, this is terrible. You know, they might get interested in another religion or maybe they won't even be interested. They'll be so turned off. Maybe they think, well, if that's the way things are, you know, why should I try to be like my parents? I'll just go off and do my own thing. So, really, attachment. Metta is considered to be a kusula. Kus, kusula means wholesome common. 
If we practice metta meditation, it's good for us, it's good for others. But if we have attachment, attachment is not kusama. And actually it pollutes the metta. That's why even though husbands and wives may have some metta for each other, because they have attachment, they want their wife to be exactly the way they, they want them to be. And if their wife isn't that way, they blame them. Uh, the wife wants the husband to be exactly the way that she envisions that husband should be. So what does that do? That pollutes, that pollutes the metta that they, that they already have. It destroys it, actually. Attachment is, is not part of love. Because let's face it, you know, I mean, uh, people get married, how long does the honeymoon last? It doesn't last very long. You know, it might be a few months, but after a while, it's finished, and then you're back to your daily life. The old, the grind, the nine to five grind, as they say. You've got to go out and earn a living, you know, uh, your wife has to take care of the kids, or she also has to, has to go out and she's got a job. And then, uh, you know, then, then you really get your, your meta tested. Because then you begin to see, oh, she, she doesn't agree with me about this. I don't agree with her about that. And, and vice versa. And then, if you don't have Kanti, it will destroy your mental. It will be gone. So actually, in the talk I was going to give, there's a famous Buddhist monk who talks about how Kanti is a support for metta. The two go together. If you have patience, patient forbearance, then you will have metta. If you don't have patient forbearance, you're not going to have metta. How can you have metta if you have no patience with other people? It's impossible. And of course, it works both ways. You know, mental will also support patience. If you love someone, you'll be patient with them. You won't expect them to... I mean, some children, let's face it, some children are slower, slow learners. Some children are very quick learners. As soon as you tell them something, they know what to do. Other kids don't learn so quickly. You have to be patient. If you're not patient, then what's going to happen? The kid goes to school and thinks, I'm no good. I'm no good. I can't, I can't learn. Mommy said I can't learn. And then, you know, he won't, that child won't feel any incentive. If you're with your kids and you say, oh, Jimmy, that was really great. You learned so quickly. You know, oh, I'm really glad you learned how to do this. Or, wow, that's wonderful, Jimmy. If they show you something they made or something they did. Oh, wow, really, really show you're interested. And don't pretend. It's got to be real. If you really care for your kids, you'll be interested in what they're doing. You know, what they're learning. What, if the kid tells you something, if your child tells you something. You can really be interested. If you love your child, you'd be interested. And you won't, you won't force them to follow in your footsteps. You'll love them anyways. So, I know my father was a doctor. He wanted me to be a doctor. And I disappointed him. But, um, of course, it was during the Vietnam War. And he wanted, one of his reasons was to... Uh, uh, avoid the draft. He thought if I was in school studying medicine, I wouldn't have to go and fight in Vietnam. But as it was, anyways, I dropped out. <laughs> That's what happened back in those days, you know. People dropped out and started doing, you know, looking in other directions. But still, he didn't withdraw his love for me. He was still the same father, and I still saw him as the same parent. So it may have been a little bit of a disappointment for him, but he didn't reject me for that. So we never want to reject our children because this will create a, uh, a psychological scar in them and it will influence all their future relationships. If your parents feel that they don't love you, that you don't love them, they may not feel love for you. And I can tell you this much. If you have a psychological problem with your parents, you're going to have a difficult relationship when you get married. It will, and that, that, those feelings that a man has towards his mother or father and that a woman has towards her mother and father, they will uh, eventually arise and surface in the relationship that you have with other people and especially with the person that you decide to share your life with. So it's really important that if we can avoid avoid creating that kind of attitude in our children. Of course, as I said before, some children 
No matter what we do, we can't we can't change the way they, they're going to grow up. But there's a lot of others, children, who have that kusala kama and have that affinity with us that we can help them. We can we can really provide the supporting factors for them to grow into wonderful adults, wonderful people. And sometimes I think if if our parents and our grandparents who passed away, if we see if they know in some way, either directly or indirectly, that we're being good parents, in a sense that's repaying our debt of gratitude to them. So, I'm not sure if I have a lot more to say right now. Oh yes, uh, a few more things about having fun together, doing things together. I think I mentioned this before, but like I told you, I used to go swimming with my father. Sometimes our family would go on picnics. And it really made a kind of a nice family community. It's the beginning of society when, when a family does things together, you know, swimming, talking, you know, maybe sometimes my parents would have a birthday party and invite the friends over and we would all be together, sometimes on religious holidays. It's really a nice time for the kids, you know, it's a really special time. Like on Vesak Day, the kids come, they're with their family, they're meeting other children, they're, they're, you know, they're learning about Buddhism, and they're, it's a fun time, you know. It's a celebration, and uh, that kind of thing helps to create really good memories in children, and a really good, positive relationship. And also, if they, if they have those good memories, it, it may someday actually bring them closer to the practice of the Dhamma, to, practice, to following the Buddha's footsteps. Um, okay, now for the difficult part. I said not to kill, but there is one thing you might want to kill, and that's your TV. <laughs> because TV, and also maybe more so nowadays, see I'm from the older generation, we didn't have computers back when I was a kid. But now I think maybe computers are, are more popular than TV, you know. Kids are on computers playing video games at the age of three now. It's pretty amazing. But parents need to exercise some control over this. Because, uh, you know, I mean, one of the precepts is not to take alcohol or drugs. But in my opinion, television and computer are electronic drugs. You really get hooked on them. You get addicted. It's true. Some people get so addicted that they they can't even sleep at night. They're always having chat rooms, they're always on the computer, always on the internet. They spend their lives on the computer. When I was young, it used to be more TV because there was no computer. On school holidays, I used to sit around watching TV. And sometimes when I was married, you know, with my wife, I told her not to get cable. But anyways, <laughs> you know, it happened. And so, sometimes on weekends, we just sat, we'd sit in front of the TV, and I felt like, oh my gosh, this precious time where we could really be developing, cultivating our relationship, was just spent in front of the TV like vegetables, just vegetating. You know, what a waste, what a terrible waste. I mean, if you want your child to do something recreational, have the kid read a book, you know? I mean, there are such things as books, you know? And, well, I won't say anything to you, about that, but uh, you don't have to go out and read a virtual book. People can actually give you a book, a real book, you know, hard, hard copy, you know, with paper and ink, and you can read it. There was such, you know, there was a tradition years ago in England and the U.S. where people used to be very uh, creative writers. They, uh, writing was considered a skill and, and, and an art, something to be developed. But nowadays, it's just, it seems to have degenerated into now it's just a question of blogging. People don't write anymore, they blog. And <laughs> it's just, it's, it's like, an, it really is an addiction. And I think also that it, it's not good for the health. And uh, it takes away that valuable time where people could be relating to each other like human beings. You're relating to virtual reality. It's not, it's not the real thing, at least on a relative level. You know, it's not like when I was a kid, we'd go out and kick the ball around, maybe we'd play soccer, or some football, or baseball, 
we'd run around, we'd get into trouble sometimes, and uh, uh, we'd have fun. It was physical. You actually talk to other people as human beings, but you don't do that on the computer anymore. You have virtual relationships, even virtual relationships between men and women, you know? Uh, society is, and then you become totally dis disoriented. My wife used to work with, or she still does, my ex-wife, <clears throat> works with special needs children, children who have disabilities. Now there's disabilities called, one disability called attention deficit disorder, and another one called autism, and there's learning disabilities. And these are children who just, they can't focus their minds anymore. And there's an epidemic in the U.S. of kids like this nowadays. Now some of it could be due to uh, using more preservatives and more chemicals in the food. But I think, and I, I'm sure my ex-wife would agree with me, I think that the fact that children are just overstimulated through all their senses by media, by videos, by Walkman, by television, they're just overstimulated that they can't focus their minds anymore. Instead of going off and taking a walk in the park, the kids take a walk in a virtual park. And then they're constantly, you know, they're, so their eyes and their ears are getting bombarded by media, which can have a very corruptive influence on them. And then in terms of meditation, being on a computer is like, uh, is a dualistic, it proliferates uh, thoughts. So, instead of going out and being in, in the quiet, in the wild with the birds and, and, and you know, maybe a lake, breathing fresh air, being, and then feeling quiet and calm and peaceful because being in nature, sometimes we can feel that way. And that's why monks like to go out and be in seclusion, to be in the woods, because the woods can have, of course, it may not be easy sometimes, but they can also have, can also have a very calming and clarifying effect. And it brings us back to nature. At least we know we're a part of nature. We're not a part of a computer. It's like people are actually, it's like it becomes like an umbilical cord. It's like they're connected to the computer. That's their lifeline. And then, you know, things go from bad to worse. These kids don't, de don't develop social relationships anymore. I've listened to young children talking. I can't even understand what they're talking about anymore. It's all computer language. Yeah. And then I, I see kids walking around with these laser guns, you know, after Star Wars, you know. They want to be Darth Vader or something, and they've got these laser guns, and they're talking about movie stars and computers, and, and it's just, it's a whole other world. So, I think in that area, parents need to exercise some restraint, you know. Even if you have, if you decide you really want to live with the television, then you need to exercise some control there. And uh, computers too. And also, you should know, there's a lot of garbage on the internet. And I don't even think, think garbage is such a word because garbage can be turned into fertilizer and then plants can grow from it. But the kind of garbage on the internet can, can make very sick people. I know because, you know, when I, when I worked with my wife, you know, with uh, helping special needs children through yoga, there were people who wrote the most disgusting letters on the email. I mean, things that, that would just turn your stomach about taking advantage and abusing special children. Very disgusting. Because people on the internet, they can say anything they want, and you can't sue them, you can't do anything, you can't even find them. So, you know, people get exposed to a lot of very unwholesome things on the computer. And you don't, you don't always have control. You can try to be controlling. You can try to control it, but you can't always do that. So, although unfortunately the computer seems to have become a necessary tool and component of present day life, I think what we have to do is we have to minimize our virtual relationship there and try to cultivate a relationship with real people you know, in real time, and also with our own true feelings. Because, we're, we're, you know, when you spend too much time on a computer, you don't even know what you think anymore. You, you, you start getting on blogging, you see this person's opinion, that person's opinion, 
And pretty soon your mind is so full of different opinions because everybody wants to express their opinion on, opinion on the computer. And they tell you about the most inane details of their lives. So I don't know if you want to waste your lives in that way. Because to me it's a waste. I mean, better that you have a real living relationship with another person than something that doesn't really exist. It's non-existent. It's only in your imagination. So, please remember the dangers of the electronic media and how that can lead to a lot of problems with kids when they grow up. Sometimes I wonder what the future of the world is going to be like, you know, if all these kids are just brought up on computers like that, where they're nursed on computers, their, their life is nothing but computers. How can they relate to other people? So, and I don't think it's going to help in meditation practice either. I mean, just on the sense of you, if you get hooked on it, you're going to spend all your time on the computer. You're going to think it's necessary. And there's one other little thing about computer, which when I was in Tawak Monastery, we called it Mara's Playground. Is that, uh, oh, what was I going to say? I think Mara got me there. So uh, I was going to say something about the dangers of the computer. Maybe it will come back to me. But anyways, I'm going to go on you now. Uh, so I talked about having fun together, which would be even going to a movie. If you want to go out and make a special event of it, you can go out to a restaurant with your kids, or you can, uh, not McDonald's, uh, hopefully, uh, or you can meditate with your kids, you can come here with your kids. There's a lot of things you can do with your kids. And that's really important. Now, in the U.S., what happens is both parents work, their lives are all caught up in, in, in so many things, paying for this, getting this, buying that, that what do they do? They leave their kids in front of the TV, and both parents are gone. So the child doesn't have a chance to really develop uh, a relationship with the children. So if both parents have to work, you have to remember that this is not the way things used to be in the past. It wasn't like that back in the days when male patriarchy was the rule. It's usually women stayed home and took care of the kids. Now that may sound very male chauvinistic on my part, but you know there is some benefit to that. Having a parent at home and being with the children, being with the child, and having a relationship with that kid, and being able to educate that child, and 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 helping helping that child to answer questions and develop, have a living relationship instead of putting the kid in front of the TV as the babysitter and going off and both parents go to work and finish. And then you've got, a, you've got another problem. That child is not going to develop. You know, when I lived on a kibbutz in Israel, they, they had a communistic system there, and they were trying it out. And that was is that both parents, they shared all the children. So there was no, like, the children became part of the kibbutz community, but they don't have any parents. So I don't know if they're doing that anymore, because unless all the parents become the parents of all the children, which didn't always happen, then the child is without parents. He's without role models. He's without that kind of intimate relationship, which is really the beginning, the core, you might say the seed of society, starts with the family. So that's a really essential part of the thing. I don't, I don't even know if, if they're doing that anymore, as I said, or if they even do it. Well, certainly they're not doing it in China today. but. Uh, are, well, I don't know too much about communist countries and, and how they actually raise their children, but just from the point of view of the benefits that children can receive from their, from their parents, and vice versa, actually, parents can learn a lot from their kids, too, especially Kanti, especially patient tolerance. You can really learn some valuable lessons there. So I think that this is an ancient, ancient uh, custom. I wouldn't even call it a custom. I mean, if you look at it from a biological point of view, I mean, women give birth to children. They give that child its milk. When that child is done, that child may, may need to nurse for, what, six months? Sometimes a year. So if the mother's out working, what is she going to do? You give the child soy milk? Our cows milk, 
It's not as good. They know that nowadays. And also, it's very important to have that sense of touch there, the warmth of the body. That gives the child a real sense of security. So just on a biological level, there may be some reasons why it's good to have that kind of closeness and spend time with the kids. And even if you have to work, well, of course, now nowadays, some women actually take their children to work, but that can't always happen. So if you have a young baby, it's really important to spend that time with them. One, uh, one or two last things. Uh, as I said before, you know, don't talk about too much politics and negative things happening in the world with the kids because that's going to influence them. So try to try to keep your relationship fairly positive. You know, talk about good things. I mean, when they get older, they'll find out. You know, that the world is not a perfect place, and they'll also find out that their parents are not quite perfect either. But there's no need, you know, it's like nowadays kids, you know, they're 12 years old, they're going out, they're having sex, they're taking drugs. You know, they're not ready for that. I don't think they're ever going to be ready for taking drugs, personally, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's a time and a place for everything. And if you try to get young children who haven't developed, either physically or on an emotional level, to do those things too soon, it's going to create a lot of problems, havoc in society. So, uh, one last thing, and that is about uh, relating to Conti. If you have, uh, if, you, if you're patient, if you're tolerant with your kids, then if one child maybe is a little bit more irascible than the other, a little bit more energetic, and maybe doesn't want to follow all your, uh, all your requests, a little more rebellious, then some parents might get disillusioned in that child. And then they start showing more, more interest in the other child. And that, that is showing favoritism. So parents really need to avoid that kind of favoritism. You know, they should, they should you know, meta, if you know about metta meditation, metta meditation is to share your love with all beings. It's not just you share your, you know, first you give your love to yourself, then your parents, uh, your teachers, your friends, neutral ones, and enemies. So we need to do this even start in our family. Because sometimes some children, a child may be very rebellious, but that doesn't mean that you should shun that child and give give all your your love and interest to the other child who's very obedient. It's better to be impartial. Because this is the way of method. This is the way of non-attachment, of loving kindness. Give your love to everybody. And that will set a wonderful example for your children uh, uh, that, that you have no prejudice, no bias, and uh, also they will have a relationship with other people like that. They won't, they won't perhaps show favoritism. Uh, and in, sh in terms of showing favoritism, that, let me see what Yes, if you if you have that equality, their children, your children will develop with that, and they will show that to other people in society. And if they get married, they'll also have an impartiality. And and even even with other families, it's better it's better if you're as impartial as possible. Because if we're really practicing metta, then we should have the same kind of love for other children as our own children. Now I know that's kind of a very difficult thing to do. But that's what mental meditation is. It means that we have impartial love, universal love for all living beings. And this is setting a wonderful example for us. Now if we want to see if it's possible, all you have to do is look at the life of the Buddha. The Buddha uh, lived, uh, was married. He certainly loved his, no doubt he loved his wife. And certainly he loved his son, Rahula. And yet, because he felt this irresistible drive to find the truth and to overcome suffering, he, he gave that up in order to find the truth. But when he came back and he visited, he accepted Rahula into the, into the Sangha. And yet, 
he treated him as a bhikkhu. He didn't give he didn't give him any kind of special treatment. Of course, he he did in the sense that he provided training for such a young bhikkhu at the time, because he was the youngest. And then his father, of course, Sudodana asked not to allow this to happen, so he said he, the Buddha made a rule that young children like that could not become bhikkhus. But yet, the Buddha trained Rahula. He did, when Rahula was, uh, he felt that Rahula had not understood something, he admonished him. As, and, and it's only, and there's a few suttas about the Buddha's relationship with Rahula, but of course there's far more suttas that have uh, the relationship of the Buddha with his attendant Ananda, and far more suttas about uh, Venerable Sariputta. So, of course, the Buddha had loving kindness for his son, Rahula. But he also had loving kindness for other bhikkhus in the Sangha. And in fact, he had loving kindness for all living beings. And that's why he was a Buddha. So, since I'm not a Mahayana bhikkhu, I won't say, may you all become Buddhas. But if you want to be a Buddha, may you become a Buddha. And if your goal is to get liberated from samsara, may you all become arahants, and may you practice the way, and may your children grow up to follow such a noble example, and may they also be.